Well, hey there, I'm Dr. Kate Henry, Head of Medical Education at Rupa Health. Welcome to our YouTube channel, where we bring you world-class medical experts to teach you everything there is to know about health and wellness. Today, you get to hear from Dr. Barry Tan, a PhD who spent most of his life researching vitamin E and who's credited with discovering tocotrienol. Now, enjoy hearing about how he made that discovery. What do you do with vitamin E? And I thought, oh, Dr. Tan is really just gonna educate us. Vitamin E was discovered by two scientist pediatrician at UC Berkeley almost exactly a hundred years ago. And many of us, like you said, understand vitamin E as an antioxidant good for your skin. All those are true, but probably many people do not know that alpha tocopherol, which is known as a vitamin E, became a vitamin not for any of those reasons. It became a vitamin, and, and the letter was E at the time, was because this particular uh, chemical, vitamin, is able to bring a fetus to full term. That mm. is very, so actually, I think of vitamin E as a burst vitamin, like that antioxidant, it protects the fetus uh, during the uh, fantastic growth of the fetus uh, before it comes out as a baby. And so there need to be a lot of oxidative uh, protection during that period. And, and actually it's because of it able to bring the fetus to full term. Then it got the status of a vitamin. Most people today didn't know that, but know about the antioxidant piece. So that part make it a rocket to superstardom. <laughs> Probably in the first 50 years, like from 1922, uh, to 1970 or 80. And there are lots and lots of study done on those. And then came the 1990s. There was a big, big study at Harvard and the VA school. A lot of health professional was involved. And then there were like 20,000 to 30, 40,000 people. Huge study like that. And when the study came through, it failed. At best, it didn't do anything. At worst, it may cause women to have breast cancer and men to have prostate cancer like that. Then people start to put, uh, put the brakes on and say, wait a minute, what is this vitamin E? And then they found out, first, the vitamin E that they used to study this was alpha tocopherol, the most common one. And they used synthetic alpha tocopherol, which is kind of like a counterfeit E to begin with like that. So 1995 to 2010, almost a 15 year, it's kind of like in the zombie land, a dead zone. Nobody wanted to talk about vitamin E anymore. So I persisted on doing this period, thinking that, you know, I hope it won't be uh, uh, the baby thrown out with the bath water because of this vitamin E. I persisted because the vitamin E carry that I've been studying uh, is tocotrienol, the lesser known vitamin E. I started this in the early 1980s and never changed. It's less common. The common one is tocopherol, but the less common one, tocotrienol, which I, I did it on studying on chronic condition. We tested many things. And then we did it on cancer study, many, many different cancers like that. And then I stumbled one time. I, the year was 1994, Professor Johanna Seeden, and she figured out on the back of the retina of the eye uh, uh, is flanked with lutein and zeaxanthin. It filters the blue light. And that's what we know today. Everybody knows if you take lutein and zeaxanthin, it's good to prevent macular degeneration, filter blue light. So for that, we, now during, in 1994, people didn't know this. So I knew if I had gone to South America, that giant marigold. See, I'm holding a younger me, which have a lot of people <laughs> like that, see? So you can see the marigold is huge. Yeah. So I went there to look for this, taking a break from Toko Traino study, and fate has it. Literally 30 feet away from me, I found this plant. I'll show you the picture so that you know. It is from a younger me. I held a picture of the plant and then a younger me. The plant is beautiful looking. It's called a natto. Natto. I'll give you a quote. A closer look up. It, it, it looked like this. See that? So beautiful. See? It's so beautiful. If you touch it, it would stain it. And the British call it the nickname, uh, nicknaming the lipstick plant. Uh, the spelling anato is A-N-N-A-T-T-O. We use it for coloring cheeses, this and that. So it's in South America. And then I thought, wow, 
this color is the keratin, like lutein and zeaxanthin, you know? Then I said, but I know that lutein and zeaxanthin are very unstable. So, but but usually they're bound like in the cytoplasm, like beta keratin in carrot, lycopene in tomato. If you cook them, they leach out. Otherwise, they stay in the, in the cell, so they're protected. Mm -hmm. However, on this thing here, it's not protected. Notice that? If I touch it, it stains me. Then I realize, oh, this thing is not inside anything. So that, you know, if there's any sunshine on it, it would just cause it to degrade and nobody uh, would want it, you know? Then I, I was guessing. I, I really was guess, guessing, uh, Carrie. I was thinking, it must be a very powerful antioxidant that protects it. I was expecting it to be a polyphenol. Mm -hmm. but it, it, I wasn't thinking of vitamin E, polyphenol, because they are like 20, 30,000 polyphenol. And then when I look, it was not a polyphenol. It was vitamin E, one. And then I found out, okay, that's a little surprise. Then I looked further and it's, oh, it didn't contain any tocopherol, which is a common vitamin E that protect it. Then I said, oh, it contained tocotrienol. So the surprise is more and more surprising. And the most surprising part is, it is a tocotrienol free of tocopherol. So it's almost completely a tocotrienol. Why do I make a point to say completely tocotrienol? Prior to this, I had learned that besides tocotrienol being the most potent, mm -hmm. if a tocopherol is present with the tocotrienol, the tocopherol interferes with the function of tocotrienol. Now, now, when I say this, right, it's kind of like against the grain, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Carey, and because most people in our consumer world, and I'm not against them. It, we usually think that, you know, if you have a single compound that work, it is in allopathic medicine. One compound work on one disease like that. And, and we are part of the holistic movement. So if you eat things from plant, usually you have several compounds and all of them make sense together a, a, as, a, as a composite a, a material. I don't have problem with that. You know? However, for the consumer and the practitioner, remember this. If you accept in life that a composite of different things is synergistic, you must also consider the possibility of antagonism. So, so if they synergism, but luckily, most of the time, things are not antagonistic. They are synergistic. This is one of the rare exceptions. I, I really did not expect that. I found out, I just thought that, well, alpha tocopherol present with toco, try, you know, they're all vitamin E. They should be good. And, and if it didn't uh, bother anything, then it's innocuous. I didn't, I found out that it was, the alpha tocopherol was not innocuous. It actually interferes with the function of tocotrienol. And this is how I explained this, that, that, that we, we study colon cancer, many, uh, uh, lowering cholesterol, other, but the colon cancer. So the professor who did the work, say if you use this much, uh, this much of tocotrienol, and it would lower the cancer all the way down. Mm. And then in the next study, he used the same cancer and he used the same amount of tocotrienol. Now he purposely add back 25% tocosterol. Mm. It's add back. And when he did, the amount of cancer did not kill all the way. Some, some of the cancer cells survived. And then when he add more tocosterol back, more survived. And when he get to like about 50% alpha tocosterol compared, the tocotrienol stay the same. You add 50% back, none of the cancer died. Then I said, <gasps> oh my God, you know, this tocopherol is actually blocking the function of tocotrienol. So therefore, after that, and all our study after that, when we do clinical trials, we make sure uh, that the patient are not taking tocopherol uh, like that. And and then for, uh, for other people, I don't really find a reason why people should be supplementing with alpha tocopherol with, with a lone exception. And the lone exception would be in an expectant mom. Oh. Uh, in prenatal, remember? Yeah. It's, 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 a, it's, a, birth, it's a birth vitamin like that. Then in the prenatal, you want alpha tocopherol. But after the baby is born, which means that for most part of her life, for the entire life, 
of men because they don't carry baby, you know, like that. So therefore, alpha to control is adequate when we eat fruits and vegetable and vegetable oil, but not nest, not need to be supplemented. That is the reason why I think in the 1990, all the alpha to control uh, clinical trials in the huge clinical trials failed because the alpha to control didn't work. So I'm just really fortunate. Uh, Dr. Kerry, I persisted with this vitamin E. It's kind of like, this is not only my baby. If I die with it, I die trying. So yeah. I'm very passionate about this, but lucky for me, somebody up there is looking down at me. I persisted on doing this. And now I see huge amount of benefit to people with toco trieno. So. We hope you liked today's podcast clip. And if you want to learn more, check out the Root Cause Medicine podcast on Spotify, YouTube, and Apple Podcasts.